Hello and welcome to this video for OCR A-Level Physics in the Forces of Module uh, topic and we're going to be looking at the concept of resolving vectors. So in today's lesson we're going to be looking at how to resolve vectors into their individual components. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson we should be able to describe the differences between scalar and vector quantities detail how to represent vectors, and then explain how to resolve resultant vectors into horizontal and vertical components. So in this lesson, we're going to be looking at the following part of the OCR A-Level Physics Specification. 2.3.1, Scalars and Vectors, in particular, resolving a vector to two perpendicular components. So, just as it's possible to add two vectors together to get a resultant vector, it's often very useful to break a diagonal or resultant vector into its perpendicular components. So this makes it easy to describe the motion of an object and to do any relevant calculations. So we can split up our um, resultant vector into horizontal and vertical components, and that allows us to describe the horizontal and vertical motion of the object. So, if we consider a resultant vector... Well, a single force or vector can always be resolved into two component forces or vectors at right angles to each other. Now, in this case, resolve means to split. Now, the two component value added together to give the, will give the same effect as the single resultant value. So a single resultant vector, as we said, can be resolved into horizontal and vertical components. So we can think about the effects of each component separately, and we can say that as perpendicular components are independent of each other, because as the two components are 90 degrees to each other, a change in one value of the component will have no effect on the other value of the component. So if we consider a resultant vector as follows. So we've denoted the resultant vector as f. If it's at an angle thigh from the vertical and an angle theta from the horizontal, well therefore we can say that the resultant vector can be thought of in its vertical component fy and its horizontal component fx. So here we can say f squared is equal to fy squared plus fx squared. And also, as we can rewrite this and to make it a little bit easier, so what I've done is I've swapped the position of the vertical axis to allow you to see this concept is just the same as the triangle you've drawn previously. And in this process, you can use the angle produced by the vectors, not the direction uh, reference, and look at the angle used carefully. So what we can say is that the horizontal component is equal to f, F cos theta and that the vertical component Fy is equal to F sine theta. Now these come from trigonometry because we know that sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So in this case when we look at the angle the opposite is the vertical component Fy and the hypotenuse is the resultant F. So therefore rearrange that we can say Fy is equal to F sine theta. So this all comes from trigonometry ratios. So in the same concept we know that cos theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. When we look at the angle theta, the adjacent is fx and the resultant is f. So therefore cos theta equals fx over f. So therefore fx equals f cos theta. So once again, this comes in trigonometry ratios. So these equations can be used to calculate both the horizontal and vertical components of a resultant vector. So for example, consider the following resultant vector, uh, 10 newtons at an angle of 40 degrees to the horizontal. So this shows we, it's actually made from two, result, uh, two individual components, one in the vertical of 2.4 new, newtons upwards because Fy equals F sine theta, so 10 sine 40, which is 6.4, and a second uh, vector, which is 7.7 .7 newtons to the right in the horizontal because we know Fx equals F cos theta, so 10 cos 40 is equal to 7.7 .7 newtons to the east or to the right. So the two component values added together give the same effect as the single resultant value. Now remember they don't add directly so it's not 6.4 plus 7.7 .7 to form the resultant as you've got to consider the direction they act in. So to clarify, a vector can be separated into perpendicular components given only its magnitude and its angle from one of the component axes, but this requires the use of trigonometry. So for example, what are the horizontal and vertical components of a vector with a magnitude of 6 meters per second squared and a direction of 60 degrees from the horizontal? Well, we know, firstly, if we think of the horizontal, we can say that fx is equal to the resultant cos theta. 
So therefore it is equal to 6 cos 60, so it's 3 metres per second to the right. We know it's the right because that's the direction the horizontal vector is pointing in. And in the vertical, we know that the vertical is equal to Fy F sine theta, so it's going to be 6 sine 60, so it's going to be 4.2 metres per second upwards. And again, we know it's upwards because we can see the direction of the arrow in the diagram. So you can see our both the horizontal and vertical components. So the two component values will add together to give the same effect as a single resultant value. Once again, they don't need to add directly to form resultant as you've got to consider the direction. Now we can also resolve vectors by using scale diagram methods. So if we look at the scale of a scale diagram and say one centimeter equals 10 newtons, we can produce a right angle triangle with the resultant vector as the hypotenuse. You would then measure the length of the vertical vector with a ruler and convert it to a value via the scale and then we would measure the length of the horizontal vector with the ruler and convert it to a value via the scale. So following these three steps will allow you to work out the horizontal and vertical components of the different vectors. So the two component forces will add together to give the same effect as a single force. Once again, we do not add the horizontal and vertical vectors uh, directly to form the resultant as you've got to consider their direction. So, you should always resolve vectors in the directions that make the most sense for the situation. So, if you have an object on a slope, you should choose the directions along the slope and at right angles to it. So, for example, when this trolley is released, it accelerates down the ramp it's on because of the weight of the trolley. Now, we know the weight acts vertically downwards, although this by itself does not determine the resulting motion. However, the weight does have a component which acts down the slope. So, by calculating the component of the trolley's way down the slope, we can determine the acceleration. So in this instance, resolving the forces is useful because the two perpendicular components of the vector will not affect each other. So you can deal with the two different directions, horizontally and vertically, separately. So to simplify the situation, we'll assume that there's going to be no friction. So the forces acting on this trolley are the weight, which is acting vertically downwards, and the contact force, which will symbolise as N for the normal contact force, which acts at right angles to the ramp. Now you can see uh, that once you've drawn the diagram that the forces cannot be balanced since they're not acting in the same straight line direction. So, to find the component of W down the slope, we need to know the angle between W and the slope. So the slope makes an angle of theta with the horizontal, and you can see from the diagram that because it's going to form a little mini right angle triangle in the left hand side here, that the angle between the weight and the ramp is 90 degrees minus 90 degrees because of the rules of a right angle triangle. So therefore, the component of the weight down the slope is going to be W cos 90 minus theta, which when we know our rules of trigonometry is W sine theta. We then know that the angle between N and the slope is 90 degrees, so therefore the component of N down the slope is N cos 90, which is 0, because the cosine of 90 is 0, so N has no component down the slope. So this tells us a couple of things. This tells us that the trolley runs down the slope because of the influence of its weight, not because it's pushed by the contact force N, because N has no component in that particular direction. So this shows us why it's useful to think of it of these things in terms of the components of forces or components of vectors. Because therefore, in this situation, if we don't know the value of n, we can ignore it actually because it has no effect on the dynamics of the situation. So that brings an end to our lesson today. If we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to resolve a vector into two perpendicular components, fx equals f cos theta and fy equals f sine theta when theta is the angle from the horizontal. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to describe the differences between scalar and vector quantities, detail how to represent vectors, and then explain how to resolve vectors into horizontal and vertical components. So Thank you very much for watching this lesson, which is part of the forces and modules, sorry, forces and motion module in the OCR A level physics specification in the subtopic of motion, and we're looking at resolving vectors. Thank you so much for listening, everyone, and as always, have a lovely day.